live, local. This is Fox 12 Now. It's just such fascinating work that you're involved in. And, you know, for everybody out there, just to, I, I mean, and me too, I would love to hear a little bit of the backstory of how, you know, the DNA Doe Project came about and how you got involved in that and that, you know, what made you want to do that? Sure. Thanks for having me, Greg. So there has been a technique around for a while um, to help people who are adopted, um, or otherwise have questions about their parentage to figure out, you know, who their biological family is. And it was some years ago, back in 2017, when uh, our co-founder, Dr. Margaret Press, uh, who often used this technique to help adoptees, was um, reading a novel about a Jane Doe, and it occurred to her that why can't we use this very same technique to identify all these unidentified human remains cases that we have in the United States. It's essentially the same, right? They don't know who their biological family is. Uh, so then the challenge really became, is it possible to get a DNA profile from say skeletal remains of the type that we need uh, to sort of mimic the same profile people when they take a direct to consumer test get? that sort of became the hurdle. And once it became clear that that was indeed technically possible, you know, that's that's when the technique took off. Um, in terms of myself getting involved, I think like many people, I had genealogy as sort of a hobby and then uh, uh, I became a professional genealogist through a lot of training and I had sort of this uh, side job. I'm a, actually an epidemiologist or medical scientist um, was my, my first career, uh, but it's just such rewarding work to be able to help people in this way and to restore dignity to those people who have passed away and become unknown that it really just just felt like a calling. So I moved away from my my previous job and became more and more involved with DNA Dell Project over the years. And I became one of the executive directors uh, just just over a year ago. Wow. I mean, that's amazing that you're able to do that. I mean, and when you think about you know, I mean, remains are found all the time, you know, say yeah. in the woods or something like that. I mean, all over the place, obviously, but you hear of those stories. Those ones are the ones I'm thinking about where sure. probably fairly decayed, but I mean, you're able to get enough DNA from something like that to identify someone. Yeah, absolutely. We're very often looking at what we call skeletal remains that have been outdoors for an extended period of time. Um, most of our cases would fall into that category. So these are indeed very challenging samples. They've been exposed to the elements for a long time. There's both sort of degradation over time, right, but also contamination. So there's a lot of bacterial DNA that gets sort of mingled with the human DNA. So it is very much a technical challenge to extract the human DNA in sufficient quantity and quality uh, for us to be able to move forward with the profile. But, you know, labs are uh, on it, they're working hard. And even just in the time that our organization has been around, we've been able to work with more and more challenging samples successfully. Um, and I expect that to, can, to continue. So that's um, definitely a real help for, for our work. Have you seen, you know, with the advent of more technology or I don't know if artificial intelligence or generative learning helps with any of that, but have you seen the technology help with a lot of that? Yeah, I mean, one of the most notable, uh, I think, advancements just in the time since we've been around uh, since 2017 
is the ability to now take uh, a single rootless hair and sequence the entire genome from that. I mean, hair, fortunately, actually protects DNA pretty well. The problem is that it's very what we call fragmented DNA, just sort of by virtue of, of the nature of hair. And in the past, you know, people thought, well, unless there's a, a, a root on the hair, it's really not useful for DNA. Um, we had cases that in the early days, we tried multiple times to get DNA from bones or teeth and failed. But once this technique was developed and we circled back and asked, hey, do you have any hair? And they did. Those cases are now resolved. So that was a pretty incredible advancement. Um, in terms of artificial intelligence, that's a great question. I think there probably will be some applications you know, for that in our work, but it's a little bit to be determined. And of course, we have to be very careful because you know, these are sensitive cases and we need to make sure that all the information is staying enclosed within a, a safe environment. And so, you know, AI has to be approached, of course, very carefully. Yeah, that's a, a very good point. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Um, well, when it comes to naming the dead, can you tell us about, you know, this show and, and maybe a couple of these cases that you're working on with this? Sure. So naming the dead uh, follows us really from start to finish for six cases over six episodes. And it, it gives a view of our work that the public's never had before. But in addition to that, it also highlights the dedication of the agencies that we work with. So law enforcement, medical examiners, and coroners. There are some extremely dedicated people who literally have worked decades on cases. They are just tenacious and dedicated. So the public uh, public's eyes get open to that. Um, they also, I think, would will gain an appreciation of the issue. There are over 50,000 sets of unidentified human remains in the United States alone. So this is not a small problem. Um, and aside from restoring the, the dignity to the individual, right, the dignity of having their name back, um, you know, for each of these does, as we call them, there's a family that doesn't know what happened. And I think you really see that in the series, too. What is the impact of these identifications on family who have gone sometimes decades uh, having misinformation about what happened to their loved one um, or just wondering and, and just having this very difficult ambiguity? So the show really highlights all of that. Um, these episodes are all interesting. A, people come from different walks of life um, and you know from different states throughout the United States. Every case, I can say, has you know, just sort of a fascinating story behind it. And these six, of course, are no, no exception. Wow. I mean, 50,000 unidentified remains. I mean, that's just staggering. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something at the beginning where, you know, you found this line of work that, you know, started off as maybe a side job, but now, <laughs> um, you know, pretty much doing this. And it, you mentioned the rewarding aspect of it. So for you, you know, when you get something like that, say some remains that have been out, outdoors, they're degraded, but you're able to work through all of that and identify it, you know, how does that feel for you to be able to approach someone and say, hey, I think this is your relative? You know, it's very bittersweet, I have to say. When we're in the, you know, the throes of the research and working really hard with what are, you know, these very challenging puzzles in effect, um, as we get closer to the solution, and usually we know, it's of course very exciting and very gratifying because you can feel it and you've been working really hard and you're going to be able to say to the agency that you're partnering with, partnering with, you know, this is who we think it is. And now it's in your hands to, to confirm that this lead we're offering um, is accurate. But at the same time, once we do that handoff, we know that there's a family that's getting a knock on the door and these are not the answers they'd hoped for, right? I think most families hold out some hope that maybe their loved one's going to walk through that door again. So not the answers they'd hoped for. So I, you know, there's definitely some sadness there as we consider what the family's going through. But almost universally, the feedback we get is that, I, I wouldn't say closure because sometimes very horrific things have happened to their loved ones, but I would say it's a resolution. And at least that gives the family an opportunity to process the loss and to grieve appropriately. And they really, you know, are, that that's not, afforded them when they're in the state of, of not knowing what happened. So it's, it's bittersweet. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it feels like, you know, it's a gift, um, a gift for the families. We don't often 
work directly with families, although sometimes we do if the agency arranges it and the family is interested in understanding how it was that we were able to return the name. Um, and it's just so powerful and so moving to see the impact of the identification on the family. And, and that, that's something viewers will get to see in the series. That's, that's amazing. I, I like that what you said, not closure, but resolution. Because, but yeah. even that, you know, at least that answers a question for someone, you know, to, yeah. to be able to know that. And Yeah, uh, and families often, their loved ones' remains can go back to them and they can be, you know, buried in the family cemetery or, or their life can be honored with a service according to the family's customs. And, and I think that's an important piece as well. Wow, amazing. Well, this show is, as you mentioned, you know, we're going to get to see some of this and how this works. And I think a lot of people are gonna be really fascinated with that. And, uh, you know, thank you for doing the work that you do. I oh, mean, this is thank you. so important, you know, 50,000 unidentified remains. I mean, that's like, I meant that number is yeah. just so big, but solving some of those, you know, getting, getting some of those answers out there. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me.